So we're gonna we're gonna continue where we uh, where we left off last class. We just started chapter 14, work and energy. So we're we're switching your your mind mindset from the F is equal to M A idea, and we're giving you a little bit more of an idea of these concepts called work and energy. And if you remember last class where I left off was our very first look at what work looks like if you analyze it for gravity. And we said, here's a ball rolling down a hill, and we arrived at an equation, which was this negative mg multiplied by delta y, a y2 minus y1. So you can look back at your notes. And so here's, this is just a quick little 10 minute warm up problem, something that we're all familiar with when we're inside of an elevator. You're standing there, the elevator either goes up or it goes down, and you feel either a little bit more heavy when the elevator is going up, or you feel a little bit more light when the elevator is going down. So how does this, you know, we, we've done this analysis before, but I want to use this as a really quick example to get our terminology correct. If I have this elevator problem and it's going, say, accelerating upward where y is positive up, mass of the passenger is 70 kilograms, initial velocity vi is zero, um, and the elevator moves up six meters, so let's say about two floors. Um, what is the work done by gravity on the passenger, and what is the work done by the normal force of the floor on the passenger? So, so here's, a, here's a very simple case, right? We're going to take our free body diagram. So here's, the, here's the, the passenger, and right away, your diagram is just mg of the passenger down, that's the weight and we see that there is an Fn that, that works upward based on the floor of the elevator. Here's my positive y. And so in the y direction, you should recognize the following. May is equal to Fn minus mg. Okay, so that seems, seems pretty reasonable. And in fact, Ay is given to you. Ay is just for four meters per second squared, okay? So, so how do we calculate work then? So work is very simple. We're gonna start with the gravity one. So A for gravity, what is work done by gravity? Last class, the equation was negative mg y2 minus y1, okay? And I just wanna throw some numbers there just to give you some context what this number might look like. UG, therefore, is going to be negative 70 kilograms. And Y2, the final location, is 6 meters above. So this is a plus 6 meters. And of course, I forgot my G. This is 9.81 meters per second squared, right? So 70 times 6 times 9.81. UG is going to be negative 4,120 joules. So we have a negative sign, okay? And then when it comes to part B, we're asked what work was done by the normal force of the floor? So the way you do this is you calculate your Fn, and Fn is just from the Newton's second law equation. You rearrange it so that it reads MAY plus MG, and this is very simply 70 kilograms with the 4 meter per second squared plus the 9.81. And therefore, un is fn times the y2 minus y1. And the final answer is plus 5,800 joules. So very, very simple example, but I want to do this because I wanted to show you plus and minus signs and the right way to understand the signs and the sense of direction. So let's just make sense of this. <clears throat> As I said before, right, gravity is acting downward all the time. If this ball is falling down a hill and the direction of the force acts in the same direction of its path, then positive work is done. So the negative sign agrees with us. It basically tells us that it is moving 
in the opposite direction. It's moving upward. And then Fn is moving in the direction of the displacement, so you get positive work. And the way you really word this precisely is you say the following. You say, for Fn, the work done by the normal force is positive on the passenger. Okay? So the work is being done. It's being done by a force. And it has a sign associated with it. It's positive on the passenger. Likewise, for gravity, the work done by the gravitational force, or the weight, is negative on the passenger in that case. Okay. OK? And then very quickly, what, what do you think would happen if I just simply flipped it around and said that the elevator went down by the same amount, 6 meters, and the acceleration was negative 4 meter per second? How many people think that the signs would just reverse? So maybe plus 4120 and negative 5800? Yeah, that's a little too easy. So. It is, it is true that one of the signs will reverse. Clearly, this one is going to reverse sign. So I'm going to say 4 So what about a equal to negative 4 meter per second squared? So instead of guessing, just do the analysis absolutely for UG, you would get the opposite, so it would be plus, oops, plus 4120. So that's OK, but Fn not so simple. I just explained to you that our intuition is that when the elevator's moving down, you actually feel lighter. So if you feel lighter, what should that imply? It should imply that because it's moving down, the acceleration or the force that you feel is smaller. You would expect the work to actually be much smaller. And that is, in fact, the case. If you calculate it un, it should agree with us. It should be fn multiplied by this delta y. But fn, in this case, is what? It's actually now may plus mg. But this ay is now a negative, right? So we're going to take this as our fn, multiply it by y2 minus y1. And in fact, this is now 70 kilograms, negative 4 plus 9.81 instead of plus 4. And then this is now negative 6 because it's going down. So un is actually a negative, but much smaller than the 5800. It's negative 2440. And so it's a much smaller number, a much smaller force, and agrees with our intuition. OK? Pretty simple. Any questions on that? Great. OK, so from, from here on out, I, I really do expect you to you know, state this you know, clearly if you were to answer this uh, on an exam, for instance. Just word it, word it the right way and be precise about it. OK, so that's our quick little warm-up example and the refresher of last class gravity. Basically, now we should step through all the other forces that we're familiar with that act on the things that you typically deal with, right? Like a block on an incline, springs, et cetera. All these forces that we're used to seeing, how do we apply this idea of work being done by those forces? So I'm going to now continue with section 14.1. And so after gravity, our second force that I want to deal with is let's say you were just pulling or pushing with an applied force. So if you had an applied force, I'll just call this F applied.
And maybe I'll make it, for this particular case, just like in your textbook, I'll make it constant to be easy. So the idea here is you have a mass, and it's sitting on a surface. And you just happen to be pulling it at an angle. So this is my f app vector. And it's being pulled at an angle theta with respect to the horizontal axis. And the mass is pulled by this distance here, which is our delta s. It's from s1 to s2. That. OK? So force acting over a distance. Use the integral that I, that I uh, defined for you last class for work. So work by this applied force, I'm going to say it's just u, u1 to 2 of this applied. And so this is our integral. And because I'm already going to just take the magnitudes of it and use my dot product, you'll, you'll remember that one of my equations from last class was simply, let's integrate from first location to the last location of the path. S1 to S2. And what you do is you take your force vector and you just take the cosine of it, right? The component that acts in the direction of the displacement ds. Okay? And because ds, because f is constant, you can pull the, the, the f out, you can pull the theta out. Let's assume everything is constant. In this particular case, you just have this really simple take your force. F app, F app, cosine theta, and this would just be your S2 minus S1. Right? And that's nothing more than just, if you remember, I did my area under the curve. This would be like I took my F app, cosine theta. And this was just a rectangle, right? OK, so that would be the area under the curve of f app times cosine theta, the component in the direction of displacement. OK, so that's pretty easy. Let's do the next one. Next one is going to be spring. So we'll call that fs negative k times s. OK, so how do we deal with this? You do the exact same thing, u1 to 2. And I'll put a little s here. Integral S1 to S2. And the force is clearly um, you know, opposite the direction of displacement. That's why we have a minus sign built into the formula. So if you, pa if you pull on it and the spring is acting in the opposite direction, you pull it to the right, the spring will want to yank it back to the left. So we, got, we have to keep the minus sign there, negative Ks. Okay. Now, do we have any angles associated with the spring force? Uh, the answer is actually no in this particular case. So if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a diagram for you. Say you have a spring here, right? like so. For the purposes of this course, you'll remember that the spring always acts one-dimensionally in the line of motion of the mass. Right? So we're basically saying, we're going to pull it along this direction. Everything happens in the direction of the spring stretch okay, for the purposes of, of, this, of this course. And so I'm just going to say negative ks is the force. It acts in the direction of the displacement ds. And you're going to uh, perform this integral. And now we have an sds that we need to integrate. So it should look like the following. Negative 1 half k. Just do this actually. Let's do uh, 
negative one half k s squared evaluated at s one to s two, and then now I'm going to sub in the s two and the s one. Okay. So there's the formula for work done by a spring on the, mat, the object that it's connected to. And a couple, couple things here. This is a really tricky one. Sometimes I see people do this. S2 minus S1 with a square here. That is wrong. Don't do that. Okay. The whole point is you actually take the initial and final locations. You have to square them first before you do the subtraction. So make sure you're aware of that. Okay. Okay, so what else do we have here? The next one is, and the final one, we'll do friction. Okay, so two types of friction, right? We'll start with the static. U friction static. How much work is being done by static friction force? Anybody? What's that? Zero. All the time, always. Why? Because there's no displacement. Nothing's happening, right? So anytime we have just static motion, or, st or the object is static, no for no none of the forces basically will have any work done. So the only one that we're really worried about is always only the kinetic friction. Okay, and what happens with kinetic friction? So here's the surface. You're going to drag it from S1 to S2, like we normally do. And where is the direction of the friction force acting when you, when you push on it? It always acts in the opposite direction. Right. So the, the great thing about this is it's always going to be negative the direction of the displacement. So it's going to be negative FF multiplied by S2 minus S1. And in fact, I can write this out even in more detail, we can apply for sure coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by Fn, S2 minus S1. Okay? Any questions on that? I think, I think some examples would help. Right. Let's do some examples.
Okay. So this is, this is as basic as it gets. You got the mass connected to a spring. We're going to push it up the incline. And an applied force, P of 400 newtons, is constant. And you're pushing it at this angle. And you're given the location, S1 and S2, of the initial positions of the block. And then all this other information. OK. And you're just asked, what is total work done on mass m u total? Ut is my u total. Okay, so how do we how do we get to to u total? So the concept here is the following. Work and energy are just scalars. Okay? So if one force acts on the mass and gives you a certain amount of work done on it, and another force acts on the mass gives you a certain amount of work, because they're scalar values, you can just add them all together. Okay? The result is actually as if you took all of the forces and you achieved a resultant force. And that resultant force was being integrated during the entire displacement. Okay? But instead of doing that, it's actually much easier to do them individually and add them all together. So the way to do this is recall work is scalar. So you're going to calculate work done by each force, then sum them all up together. So here's my, here's my free body diagram. And you're going to get an mg. You're going to get a force of the spring this way. You're going to get normal force this way. It's going to go up, so then the friction force acts down. And then we're going to get a P force pushing here that's constant. Question? What's that? What is the equilibrium position of the spring? So uh, I haven't told you that yet, actually. right? I haven't told you that. And we will see very quickly whether or not that is important. OK? So I'll put that here. What is, and I think what you mean is the unstretched length of spring. OK, and this was not given. OK, so free body diagram good with everybody? Five forces. Here's what we mean by u total. You're going to do u from the p force plus u from the spring force u from gravity, u from friction, and u from the normal force. We're going to do all of the five u's, and we're going to calculate the total from there. OK? ug, everybody, it's minus mg, and it's y2 minus y1. Okay. But careful here, it's y2 minus y1, not s2 minus s1. So we actually have to take into account just the vertical height change. So this must be mg 
And based on the trig, it should be sine 30. Sine 30 of the total distance traveled should give me Make sure I have this here. Okay, so this is Two point five minus two point zero sine thirty negative ninety eight point one joules. Okay, and then yeah. Why is it two point five minus oh sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. You know what I did there? My notes said 2.0 because I already did the math in my head. And then I wrote 2.5 minus 2. OK, 2.5 minus 0 0.05, or 0.5, gives you that. UN, what is the normal force, the work done by the normal force? Zero, somebody said zero. Yes. Why zero? Because Fn is kind of like the supplied force, right? We can calculate what Fn is. I could just do the Newton's second law, but it's acting perpendicular to the displacement. So 90 degrees, everything cosine 90 is 0, right? OK. What else do we have here? Let's do U friction, negative mu k Fn delta s. OK, so here's where I need to figure out what Fn is. From this diagram, I'll save you the suspense. Fn is your typical mg cos theta, right? So this is my 30 degrees here. So Fn is nothing more than my, this is just mg cos theta delta s. And there's a negative sign there, negative 114. And then the applied force, UP, this one is your, your P force. So the P force, again, I have to take the component of it in the direction. So that's cosine 30. Again, 2.5 minus 0.5. 692.8 joules. And then finally, spring force, right? OK, so back to the question. We're doing work done by the spring. And if you look at the formula, do we actually need to know the unstretched length of the spring? No, it's actually hidden from the problem. You actually really only need to know how much the spring was stretched from its initial to final position. And it's because the force that is being applied is just a matter of how much you were stretching it further, how much the force was being integrated over the displacement. You actually didn't really know, have to, have to know the initial length at all. So I'm just going to plug this in, negative 1 half, 30. And I'm going to give you the S2, S1. But like I said, the trick here is remembering it's the squares are on the inside. And so finally, the spring is going to give you negative 90 joules. So I'm going to add this all together. UT is equal to. Negative 114, negative 98.1. Yep. 
get them all right. So the total amount of work done on the mass is just the sum of all of them. Yes? What's that? Are we assuming the original length of the spring is 0? Um, yeah, question? So, so my question is like, if it's like original before the beam is applied, doesn't that, the, the mass should go down a bit? Because there's like a stream like you put in on the stream. OK, yeah. So that's, and I'll take one more question here. Is it also related? Or no? what is your question? Yeah. Oh, the force that's going, oh, wait. Oh, yeah, this, this force right here. Absolutely. Good call. Uh, oh, and I did it, I did it here. My, my mistake. My mistake, my mistake. So, so 114 is correct. Good catch, good catch. One, 114 is correct, but 114 is actually, you are absolutely correct. So this was negative mu k, and the, the, M, the Fn is actually an mg cos 30 minus or plus p sine 30. Absolutely, my apologies. Let's do that. That is that was wrong. So this this is wrong. I forgot p. Okay. And then back to back to the original back to the original question. Um, Two point five is. So let, let, let's, uh, let's, let's simplify this. I will just assume that unstretched length is 0. OK. So for, so for this calculation, I'm just going to keep it the same. In my notes, basically what I was saying was ignore the unstretched length bit. But I can assure you that it is built, it is built into this, that if you have a different unstretched length, this, this, should be, this should be accounted for. The idea is the following, right? You should have fs is equal to negative k. And the x, the, 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 the s that is measured here, this is the s from an unstretched length. I get what you're saying, right? So if you, if you don't, um, how, sh how should I say it? This value was always based on the reference of it being unstretched. So in other words, when I say s1 is 0.5, I guess what I was saying here was this is from s is equal to 0 where, where, where spring was unstretched, right? Right? So basically, I gave you the information that assuming this was S1 and it was 
at s is equal to 0 was the unstretched length. Okay? So maybe I didn't word that precisely enough. OK, I think that was just, again, showing you how to add the scalars together to make sure that you got your basic use of the work and energy, or the work. Does that make sense, finally? <laughs> yeah? Could you also just define the net torque and then multiply that by the distance that you're supposed to get the freedom? Yeah, you could. So here's, here's, here's the trick. The problem is, notice how this p I told you was a constant force the whole time. right? So when you think about it, in order for this to be a constant force 400, this spring force is constantly changing with time. As you're moving up the incline, Fs is changing. If Fs is changing, Ff is also changing. Right? So, so everything is, is changing, um, and plus the block is now accelerating. So you can certainly do, you can certainly do your F is equal to you know, fx max, sum of forces fy is may. And what happens is you end up having to figure out accelerations first, then followed by everything else. OK? So what I'm suggesting is what you're going to notice with these work and energy problems is there's a pattern to when you get to use them. When, you need, when you're being asked for things like acceleration, f is equal to ma is great. In many other cases, and I'll give you another example, you're just being asked for things like displacement and velocity. And when you're asked for velocity and displacements, as it turns out, sometimes you don't even need acceleration. You can just get straight uh, the answer straight from work and energy. Okay? So I've got 10 minutes to go. I'm going to introduce this idea from 14.2 from very, very quickly, and you'll see what I mean. I assure you, you'll get the same answer if you do it correctly with the f is equal to ma. I'll take your, if it's tutorial related, I'll take it after class. But it, unless it's related to this problem, I've got to kind of move forward, right? OK, so I, I, want, I, want you to, I want you to just think about the idea and the concept here. I'm going to generalize this a little bit. And I'm going to take us to curvilinear motion with a particle that moves in a curve. OK? So the idea is as follows. If a particle moves in curvilinear motion, most ideal case we should be using nt coordinates. Here's my ut. Here's my un, right? Okay. And if this were the case, then what can we do? We can do the following. I could say that the sum of forces in the tangential direction should be mass times at. That seems reasonable. Now, let's assume that there was only one force acting on this, and this force is the sum total, the resultant force. So I'm going to draw a force vector, let's say like that. And this is my Ft, the resultant total force acting in this particular direction. Uh, in fact, I will say that is my final force F. Okay, So that's final force F. And the projection of this force is going to be in n and t coordinates. So here's my, in fact, obviously, obviously my force should be in the concave direction. So let's do this. There's my F. And so my Ft is this, the tangential direction. So this is Ft tangential resultant force. So I've taken all the forces into account, and I make it equal to mat. What is the work being done by all of the forces in this resultant force? It would be as if I did ft, and I moved along the curvilinear path by ds. 
FTDS is essentially the work that I'm doing. Okay? So if I multiply this by ds, it would be if I took mat and multiplied it by ds, correct? And what is atds from our kinematic equations? It's actually related to the velocity. So if you take your acceleration, and this acceleration could be changing, right? But for every single little differential motion ds, I can actually convert this with my kinematic equations to write mv dv. Okay? And now what I can do is I can integrate on both sides to take the entire path from point one to point two. Okay, so I'll just write here ATDS is VDV, and this was from our known kinematics. And so if I integrate, from 1 to 2 in the path, this would be like S1 to S2, MATDS is equal to integrate, oops, V1, V2, MVDV, and this is like as if I integrated FTDS. Okay, all those three things are completely identical. Okay, what is this? This is now the, what we define to be the work done on the mass. So this is nothing more than u1 of 2, the way that we've defined it. And this is mv squared over 2. So this is 1 half mv squared evaluated at two velocities, vv1, vv2. And so what you end up getting is 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv1, u1 to 2. And now I can rearrange it. Everything starts from the initial velocity. I move this over to this side, add it to the work done, and it's equal to the final 1 half mv squared. OK, does anyone recognize what this is? It's kinetic energy, right? So this is kinetic energy of the object. And this equation here is your, your chapter 14.2. This is the principle of work and energy. And conceptually says the following. If a particle first moves with an initial velocity v1, a speed v1, Right? So this is a scalar, so you want the speed. And you calculate its initial kinetic energy. If you do positive work on that particle, the particle will end up with a higher kinetic energy with velocity or speed v2. Okay? If you happen to be doing negative work, then essentially this value will be smaller than its initial, and you're, you've lost kinetic energy. Okay? So everything that we've been doing in the last couple of classes we're dealing with the work of various forces. All of that was centered around here in units of joules. And so the next class, we're going to start applying this, this principle. I'll give you one other form. We usually use T as our kinetic energy in this course. So T for Ke in this course. And so you're going to start seeing T1 plus U12 is equal to T2. And in fact, the idea here is this is, we put a little summation sign here to indicate that what we did in this class with that example, we were adding all of the different works together from 1 to 2 by all of the individual forces. So this constitutes that, 
that principle. Okay, any, any questions on that? Yeah, one last one. Say that again? Yeah. Yeah. Not allowed. Okay, the question, the question was, why did we use tangential acceleration in the kinematic equation to derive this? It's because it's the only acceleration you're allowed to use. You cannot, you cannot use this in any other form except for when you're rectilinear motion, right? Or if you're in NT coordinates, then this applies, right? Otherwise, it doesn't apply. OK? All right, so I'll see you on Friday.